one. Aloha and welcome. Welcome to Global Connections. I'm your host, Carlos Suarez. And joining me today is a colleague uh, here at the University of the Americas Puebla uh, in Cholula, Mexico, Patricia Ruiz Navarro. Patricia, thank you for joining us here on Global Connections. On the contrary, thank you for the invitation. Yes, and we're, here, we're talking about a very timely, very important topic, and it deals with the Central American migrant uh, crisis that we have uh, in recent years, uh, well, in the say in recent months, it's been accelerated. But we're going to look at some different aspects. Uh, often we see the focus on just, uh, I don't know, the border security-related issues. Those are certainly important. But there's another dimension that uh, Patricia Ruiz's work has touched on, having to do more with either psychosocial uh, aspects, having to do with uh, uh, mental health and health care uh, of, of the communities there, uh, and so it's a complex set of issues, uh, and uh, what we want to do is unravel some of it for us. To help us better understand this crisis, uh, we do have a crisis on the border, but it's not one that I believe anyhow it requires a big wall. What it requires is a better understanding of the human and the humanitarian aspects, uh, perhaps the psychosocial aspects. And so joining me today, Patricia uh, Ruiz, here at the university. Patricia, tell us briefly just about your own background, because you're a professor here of psychology, uh, but you've been working now on, on projects and, and topics related to migrant communities. Tell us just briefly about your own background and your areas of, of teaching and research. Well, what is it you do here? Yeah, I, I spent about um, over 15 years in New York City where I completed my graduate studies, and I delved into the understanding, first, the general identity of migrants, but as I started mm. to get more into the subject, I understood there's many more elements that uh, relate to how migrants not only deal with uh, struggles of how do you identify themselves, but uh, mental, um, unspoken struggles mm -hmm. of um, experiences through their journey, but also on assimilating and uh, into a different mm -hmm. um, culture and place. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started to get more into the study of a of, uh, of current project that I'm um, um, launching on uh, the mental health of Central American migrants as they, as they go through transition through Mexico mm -hmm. on their way to the United States. Yeah. And so, again, this topic, of course, is very timely to date about migration, but it's a, a topic that has so many aspects. There's an economic dimension that obviously both pushes and pull migrants to come, the political aspect uh, in terms of the relations, and even, frankly, for Central America, that story of why many of them coming has a lot to do with their own conditions at home, uh, difficult uh, both violence and insecurity and lack of opportunity. Uh, but, of course, uh, the story is also a human one, and that's really what you touch on, the story of these migrants themselves, the challenges they face, the long, long journey, because we're talking about Central Americans who venture all the way through Mexico and make it to the border in the hopes, in many cases, of trying to seek asylum. Uh, there's a challenge because many of them are not easily admitted. They don't have the capacity uh, perhaps to demonstrate that. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. But as well, to help us understand it and maybe put it in some of the context, uh, let's take a look. We have a map or two. Uh, if we can turn to the first map, uh, it shows us a look at, I believe, just uh, basically some of the, the, the border uh, crossings. And, and, and uh, this has got some data telling us what uh, about what percentage of, 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 or what numbers are, are crossing yeah. here. What's interesting is that um, it shows us here how uh, the problem has dropped about 8% since 2000. Mm -hmm. So um, it is interesting, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more um, uh, on this later on. On it is, it's, it's a little bit ironic to consider the importance nowadays of, of building and strengthening the uh, military and building a bill wall when the problem is not so much mm -hmm. the, the main concern. Mm -hmm. um, so we see all across the Boarded out uh, with these two countries, which is uh, really one of the largest. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's borders. about I think about two thousand U.S. miles, and so it's the largest border between two countries at such a different level of development. Yeah. We have the U.S. as a you know sort of first world developed economy. Mm -hmm. Mexico, of course, a country in transition, uh, but in general a much lower level of development. So there's a constant pull towards uh, that. But as you know, very important, uh, the crisis is really one that's been manufactured in recent days by our president because. 20 years ago, we had a much massive flow. Uh, it has slowed down. However, the nature of the crisis today is reflected more in the type of immigrant coming, many yes. families, many women with children, yes. and that presents different challenges, of course. Absolutely. I think that uh, what shifts a little bit the focus um, was what happened last year with the uh, zero-tolerance mm -hmm. policy. 
Can tell us a little bit about that. This is a new policy that was uh, basically implemented by the Trump administration, yeah. essentially that has the effect of separating many of the uh, of the families, right? I mean, in lay terms, uh, what happens is that if one person crosses, um, a non-documented migrant crosses the border uh, and is, is detained by uh, border patrol, mm -hmm. he, this person is the same as crosses and is uh, subject to deportation, an immediate deportation. Yes. What happens is now that it's not only um, economic, young um, migrants mm -hmm. seeking economic opportunities, it's entire families fleeing mm -hmm. violence in, um, yeah. in yeah. Central America. Yeah. Yeah. So um, at the border, supposedly the illegal migrants would have to be the same. And uh, anyone else accompanying this person needs to be put in a mm -hmm. detention center until um, it's decided what, what yeah. procedure to take. So basically, by enforcing this zero tolerance, what it means is that suddenly the parent has to be separated and put into a yeah. detention. Suddenly the minors who are accompanying them get separated, and it's turned into yeah. such a drama. Because and we, have seen, we have seen those uh, yeah. um, images of detention centers yeah. uh, and the conditions in which children are... Um, yeah. Yeah. So very traumatic, and, and, and obviously things that had a profound impact on their you know, future development and whatnot. Not to mention that it was a policy, obviously put in place without a lot of forethought, because uh, the separation didn't wasn't able to reconnect many families. It's been a desperate effort to try to. I mean, there's still kids who are in the in limbo. Yeah. Um, in some parents cases. have been. I mean, some cases parents have been deported. There's Mm -hmm. Mothers back in Honduras and the kids are somewhere in a detention center. And in some cases, they've been sent far away, right? To New York, Wisconsin, uh, right. all over the country, without an ability to tell the parents. You know, if here's the. I think that one of the issues that it needs to be um, highlighted there is uh, the lack of interest in terms of representation and information mm -hmm. and uh, the opportunity to provide a translator on what they were signing in some cases. Sure. Um, like, yeah, the this kind of auto deportation that people will sign mm. we, without knowing the implications of my kid is not coming. Wow, God. So, I mean, it's yeah. almost like here, sign here, and guess what? You're going back home, suddenly your child is yeah. left in limbo, and yeah. that's just a dramatic yeah. day. But highlights also, uh, if you can go to the Yeah, the next slide here shows us some data, right? Some information about, yeah. uh, tell us yeah. what, what well, we're seeing here. We see, we're talking about this somatic experience, which for some people would be the culmination of of a very long struggling um, journey mm -hmm. in space of safety. Mm -hmm. There's people who are uh, fleeing uh, this, they, they, what is called the Northern Triangle, which is comprised of uh, the main three Central American countries, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the uh, violence there is equal to what people have experienced in uh, Iraq and some of the other. Um, African countries that uh, are facing civil yeah. wars. So this region is really the source now of many of these newer immigrants coming, in many cases families with children, uh, and essentially fleeing very difficult to violent uh, circumstances back home. Uh, perhaps for another show we can talk about really the root causes of a lot of this. Uh, also stem back from U.S. policies in Central right. America from the 1970s and 80s, yeah. where many refugees came, were finding themselves settling, in, particularly in Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, but a lot of them uh, running into trouble, incarcerated, they were then deported. So these so-called gangs that we hear a lot about, the MS-13 and others, they learned their trade in the prisons yeah. of the U.S., and they were, you know, very quickly deported. Uh, but um, I guess my point there is that there's a connection there that we can't deny yeah. and, and, and need to understand fully. Yeah. I mean, as you said, that's material for a whole different mm -hmm. show, but the historical relations of intervention of the U.S. in Central American countries to yeah. try to prevent um, um, communism in the 1980s, not just into this, into this sure. uh, and current and violence environment. And, and of course, again, uh, the other is just the, the actual ruling story, because these are migrants who are obviously trekking across all of Mexico, a very long, long, large country. It takes them there. Tell us a little bit about the story of yeah. uh, what, what it involves, how long does it take to yeah. it's, um For a migrant coming from Honduras, it would take about four to five days of a journey, um, talking through the other Central American countries and landing in Mexico. What's interesting is that um, around in around 2014, um, um, the U.S. supported a policy of uh, 
like in the southern border of Mexico. Mm -hmm. So what was at, at some point the uh, highlight of crossing through this um, um, train is mm -hmm. uh, that it's called the beast, La Bestia. Yeah, La Bestia, which is this long journey that many of them get uh, on top of the train, very dangerous. They, yeah. they have to you know, accidents fall off. But also it's a process where they're constantly abused All and right. taken advantage about. Uh, there are networks criminals. Yeah, they become, uh, it's, it's like they're carrying a target on their back. Mm -hmm. You either are subject to uh, just robbery, um, assault, uh, rape, rape or uh, or um, so and, and, and extortion. And, 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 you know, just you described 45 days, that's probably the average. There are some that may yeah. take longer. Right. And, and, and we've seen this recent emphasis on the caravans. In some ways, it yeah. represents an effort to... So it gets power in numbers. If they go as a group, they can try to provide some. I mean, I think that in the last three years, there has there's some um, very alarming figures of uh, Central American migrants mm -hmm. who were um, assaulted either in groups and and killed and left again them, or systematically just robbed and and you know living um, for that. Yeah. Uh, so it seemed like this was a time in which people started to, to organize to say our visibility yeah. will keep us safe. Yeah, the power in numbers, yeah. essentially. Yeah. And what we see, let's turn maybe to this uh, third uh, map we have of Israel here of basically the routes that they will yeah. take going through Mexico. And we can see several, uh, of course, many will make the long, long trek all the way to Tijuana on the border with California. Others uh, will stop and, and maybe go towards Texas, towards uh, New Mexico, Arizona. Yeah. And indeed, as you know, there are, of course, uh, fences, uh, you know, obviously borders, uh, and, you know, that has been strengthened in the last 10, 15 years, but it has also meant now migrants are often moving to some more dangerous areas, more inland. Yeah, it's, it's, it's troubling to know how the, also the reaction of the, uh, the Mexican population Mm -hmm. and, and how it is portrayed in the media, and also um, messages consumed from um, from the current administration and the policies mm -hmm. of, of of being um, bombarded or in, invaded. When you so, say the Mexican, I mean here, there's a lot of different aspects of that. Some of it is that many of these often suffer discrimination within right. Mexico itself. I mean, it's, uh, a, it's, it's, a, it's a scary and and. and Heartbreaking sentiment that it mm -hmm. kind of um, merges of xenophobia to the Central American migrants. And as so, in this way, some people who were heading to Tijuana, there was a really big incident as people were get getting to the asylum um, to shelters. Mm -hmm. that they started to go to different lives, but that also is like other risks. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's a human story, and I mean, on one hand, instead of billions being set on the wall, because probably invest millions in helping both the countries themselves yeah. develop and address the issues, but even perhaps for those who seek asylum, a process that might be more ideal managed back in, 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 in the home site uh, that would help facilitate that. Again, there's no easy answers to yeah. it. We, we sometimes think uh, the problem is just solved by a simple thing of building a wall. Clearly, what we need instead are social workers, judges, lawyers, uh, yeah. an ability to process what is essentially a human, uh, a human story, a human yeah. tragedy. Yeah. Let's finish. Uh, we'll turn uh, to the next slide, and, and uh, what are we seeing here? Uh, this next one shows us. Uh, it's, it's just to get a sense of, uh, you know, trying to. Uh, here, what we see here is basically some people who are crowding into a, a truck, right? right? And so as they make the journey, they're coming, uh, often they're walking or they're getting right. And this recent trend of the caravan has brought them in big clusters. However, along the way, we see them suddenly getting broken up or yeah. separated. And, and I mean, there's, there's cases where, you know, uh, young kids that come from the same uh, rural camp, at, at one point, one of them might be able to get on, 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 on the back of a truck, the other didn't, so they try to keep in contact, but that, that, that over, already took a situation. Mm -hmm. There are cases where you would think the most vulnerable people would be left uh, to, to ride <laughs> On the truck, that's that's not quiet. Excuse me, the strongest one they got yeah. on. There's some mothers that carry uh, small children, and they manage to to, to get a, um, a stroller along the way. The stroller, of course, is not going to be there. So there's yeah. little kids, um, of, you know, carrying the burden of, of, of this along with the uh, physical and emotional drain for mothers. Yeah. So that's something that are, are very common. It's a, it's a painful process, and a story, again, that has such a 
heartbreaking in the human side to it. Uh, let's do this because we have a few other things we want to talk yeah. to, but we're going to take a very short break right now and come back uh, after a minute. We're talking here with Dr. Patrizzi Navarro. He's a psychology professor here at the University of the Americas, Puebla, in Salula, Puebla, Mexico. Uh, and she's been doing some work on uh, understanding some of the challenges, some of the human side of the migration crisis that we see these days. So we're going to come back with more on the story. Please join us here on Global Connections. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Aloha and welcome to At the Crossroads. I'm your host, Keisha King. You can catch me every Wednesday, alive at 5. I'll see you there. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Our flagship energy show among the six energy shows we have is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. It plays every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Come around and see us. Learn about energy. Yeah, Keep current three, on energy on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and welcome back. Welcome to Global Connections. I'm your host, Pablo Suarez, here. Joined today by uh, Dr. Patricia Ruiz Navarro. She's a psychology professor here in Mexico who works on a range of issues related to migrants, the crisis that we're seeing unfold now with many Central Americans that are seeking asylum in the U.S. And it's a changing nature of uh, different patterns of both we see today more families with children and the whole separation that we've seen the crisis unfold. And, and Patricia, uh, of course, you, you come uh, both from, you know, you're originally from Mexico, but you had many years here in the U.S. for your studies. Um, uh, your doctorate in social psychology yes. uh, from City University of New York, a yes. uh, master's in, uh, from the New School for Social Research. Uh, and that experience, uh, understanding the community is also in New York, for example, a long pattern because this process of migration, uh, of course, it's been around mm -hmm. for ever, quite literally, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, the complex uh, interdependence of the U.S. and Mexico and Central America, where we have a large source of, on one hand, traditionally migrant workers, and there still are many who continue that pattern, but in recent years, we've seen this changing dynamic of many families now coming with children and, and you know, basically fleeing a, a very violent and you know, painful situation back home. They make the long, long journey we've been describing going through Mexico, very difficult, gangs, uh, violence, and stuff, they get to the border, and it's not a piece of cake. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what happens when they arrive there and what are some of the challenges. Well, what I think is very important to highlight is that and stress is what the region is seen as uh, economic migration, mm -hmm. which uh, traditionally um, people from Latin America will go, um, and the higher will be um, the women people. Mm -hmm. uh, or how much will they um, contribute to the economy for their country? Yes. Uh, nowadays, we can consider this, um, honest, quite honestly, a humanitarian crisis. Mm -hmm. So the way that, um, and forgive me if I, if I, if I use this, this analogy, but uh, what happens with uh, refugees from uh, um, the Middle East who are seeking um, asylum in, in Europe, um, they, they fall into the category of refugees. This population is not only requesting the opportunity to find um, labor opportunities. It is fleeing uh, extreme uh, poverty violence. But uh, in the book, the laws are very uh, precise and very rigid when it comes to the criteria of who qualifies for asylum. Mm -hmm. uh, violence uh, for coming from organized crime is not considered um, a, 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 a consider doesn't fall in the category of uh, suffering violence inflicted by the state. Yeah, cool. Therefore, it's very rare that some of the cases go through and are accepted as, as crime yeah. too. So out of the uh, number of cases that are revised per year in the U.S., 60% are rejected. When it comes to people from Central yeah. America, 70% are rejected. Yeah. So that becomes a very uh, alarming figure when you when you realize that a lot of these people are not aware that they are even now once they get to the border. Uh, they, some of them, they don't even have 
the whole paper work that, that required. Yeah, to that case. Case. to be able to make that, I mean, yeah, yeah, like you said, if it's just, you know, violence from a local gang, yeah. then it's real violence for them, of course. They've got a brother killed, they've had, you know, the yeah. family harassed. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not the same as a war situation where the state might be yeah. imposing that. And many of these countries had that in the past. In the 70s and 80s, you had a lot of more uh, formal, you know, civil wars or, or insurgencies. Uh, so that presents a challenge. You have people coming all the way to make a trek only to find out they're rejected. Yeah. Uh, and then they're stuck in limbo because they don't have the money to go back. They don't want to go back because of the reality. So it's a real difficult dilemma yeah. for them. Uh, and, uh, you know, interestingly, even as they come through Mexico, there's been a challenge for the Mexican government on what to do with the new yeah. administration here. Uh, some venture to how they try to reach out to some of them and offer them opportunity in Mexico. But the reality for many of these immigrants, they're not looking to just come to Mexico. Yeah. Because of the long network of, of immigration from Central America uh, into the U.S., many of them have family and have, uh, have, you know, have other connections. Uh, but particularly, they're, uh, I think the real humanitarian aspect is that what we've seen now is not just the traditional economic market of young male, but we've seen families, children, yeah. and, and this policy of separating them has left us, you know, just yeah. uh, struggling to understand. So the way that the... Um, um, U.S. administration, um, the Trump administration is trying to kind of uh, counterbalance that uh, bad publicity that happened after the Israel tolerance uh, policy is that it's asking the Mexican government to um, the whole, contain... Yeah. Hold them while, yeah. while they're in, in process. But that process could take months mm -hmm. or even years, years yeah. of course. And, of course, for Mexico, I mean, especially those that have made it all the way to Tijuana, uh, there's a situation there now where these shelters are over, yeah. overwhelmed, uh, don't have the capacity. Yeah. It's created a lot of tension there, uh, a lot more even violence in some of those yeah. border cities of Mexico are already violent places now, adding to them this population of, of you know, immigrants. And there's a, a clear discrimination yeah. that occurs against them, too. So very, very unfortunate. Moreover, uh, talk a little bit more about this policy because it hasn't been completely clarified, but the U.S. government has been pressuring Mexico to sort of serve as a sort of a, you know, go between as a country that will hold them while they're in process. But the challenge is that it's not easy for them to have access to legal advice and information mm -hmm. or support groups, yeah. maybe from the U.S. I mean, I think that in the end, the part of being able to process one of those applications requires an immigration order. Um, within the pool of, 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 of lawyers in the U.S., there's a portion that um, um, specializes in immigration. And to, to uh, attend to the cases of incoming migrants uh, on top of the long list, of waiting list of people who are older in the U.S., mm -hmm. it is... It's overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and not just to mention the immigrant, uh, immigration lawyers you described, but even within the U.S., the capacity of the uh, immigration uh, uh, officials uh, that process it. But literally, as I recall, uh, hearing in, in Tijuana, uh, the immigrants themselves have an informal network where they just had a, a sign-up sheet where you put your name down, uh, very, you know, sort of just emerged on its own, uh, and yet the time is a very slow process. It takes literally months for you to be called because only, yeah. it can only process a small number every day. Uh, again, there's no simple easy answer to this, but a lot of it has to be getting the right information to the right people, yeah. but also the humanitarian part, yeah. whether it's in Mexico or, or in the U.S. side, yeah. trying to address it. I think that what would be um, a true, um, um, true country front to contain and attend the problem would be something that has been uh, discussed a little bit in Europe when it comes to burden uh, sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, Yes, um, countries like Turkey are kind of like third states yeah. where to contain, but you cannot put all the burden in, in those countries that yeah. they tend to be just transition to. So European countries are, are finding ways to to help on 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 uh, the distribution of some of these migrants, and I think that in the sense of the U.S. cannot just say, you know, this is not a problem until it's a, it's yeah. a it's it's a potential um, person who, who is in current asylum. Yeah. We cannot just try to support them, which has happened, I think, in the past week. So some people have been um, sent back to Mexico to wait for, for their cases to be resolved. Yeah. They, uh, the current Mexican uh, uh, administration has been very clear that they would not accept 
in one under 18, mm -hmm. which is a lot of a very large proportion of money uh, on the company's minors. Yeah. minors. So, so that keeps many of those minors stuck in the U.S., and the parents may not be able to get in or otherwise be held in, in, in process. You were describing the, the situation in Europe, which uh, about three years ago was at a massive scale, and as you know, there was an effort to try and address those countries that are the transit countries, mm -hmm. namely Turkey, where the European Union has effectively given Turkey a fair amount of money to help yeah. hold them there. I don't see that happening on the U.S. side, and, and yet uh, clearly if the U.S. wants to address this and maybe you know stop that flow, it probably would need to provide Mexico with support for that, but I, I just don't see that in the cards for the U.S. Uh, they would like pressure Mexico to take a role if Mexico's in its delicate balance trying to figure out, well, what should it do? It's not its problem, and yet, like it or not, the problem is uh, in Mexico as well, which is right. large, yeah. large numbers of immigrants there. Yeah. Now, maybe uh, uh, you finish a uh, continued dialogue on this. What are some of the, I guess, the challenges in terms of you know, social impact, uh, human development? I mean, uh, these, especially the young the children and the, even the mothers that are being separated. I mean, it's one thing to just see them and, and it's painful and heartbreaking, but long term, it also has a profound impact on their ability to, well, to, to, to develop as, as, as humans. And, yeah. and Developmentally, there's this whole idea of attachment. Mm -hmm. uh, the first uh, two, three years uh, of life, it is so important to have a, a primary, a primary caregiver mm -hmm. who serves as a buffer of how to understand. So when that child is is um, removed from the parents, there's no one to look um, to to get a sense of how to um, understand the situation. So that has already um, has impact on, on post-traumatic, it, it's, it's a, it's a tra traumatic exper uh, experience. It affects uh, the capacity laid on to build trust in relationships, yeah. but also the trauma of, I don't know at what, time, at what point I'm going to be from from my parents or, or save this kind of dilemmas. I mean, there's, there's situations with kids um, in uh, detention centers that are, are suffering from insomnia uh, who, who can't. I mean, it, it's a physical, psychological, emotional, mm -hmm. uh, developmental um, concerns mm -hmm. that are already being uh, um, looked into by, by uh, child care providers. Yeah. Um, so, again, the challenge is just overwhelming on so many levels. Yeah. And it's a, both a changing pattern of the, of the type of immigrant, uh, the separation policy from the U.S. that has created this different type of problem, uh, and the challenge that many of these coming are not likely to get in under an asylum, uh, you know, the refugee status, uh, because the, you know the, the, the circumstance, while it is very real and violent, it doesn't qualify for the criteria that it's a, you know, it's a different kind of violence, which is, is quite tragic. Again, no easy solutions, but obviously we have to understand. Uh, the range of complexities, uh, the social, psychosocial aspects that we've talked about, uh, and uh, hope uh, hope for the best. That, that, that could, and only by, I guess, putting spotlight on these things and, and understanding the implications of what it means to separate families, uh, it, it, it requires us to, to hopefully put pressure on government leaders to do something better. Uh, not an easy solution these days, particularly uh, given uh, the focus on the, the Trump administration just to build a wall uh, and there is a need to control borders, but there's also a need to look at what are yeah, the sources exactly. of it. Uh, and I go back to this, you know, this problem will never be solved unless the conditions back in, in these host countries, yeah. uh, the home countries that they're coming from, uh, unless they can solve issues yeah. of, of violence there and, and development and opportunity. Uh, it will never be solved. It was, it was, the relationship has been, in terms of the flow of migrants, it's been there for decades. Yeah. It's not going to go away. Uh, I would maintain that ultimately there's got to be some day, and, and heaven forbid, it still away from us, but there has to be a process of legal immigration. The U.S. economy requires it, needs it, uh, and, you know, and yet we don't have a, a guest worker program. Uh, it does exist for Canada, and so many come from Mexico and other countries, uh, short term employment legally. Uh, but for the U.S., uh, we don't see that in the cards now, and, uh, and yet that's ultimately the only solution, having a guest worker program. Uh, and, and maybe better information so that these families aren't stuck making the journey only to find they get the door closed when they arrive. Yeah. Uh, better uh, would be for them to understand that that's not happening or that they've got to make the case yeah. back, back home, yeah. uh, but easier said than done, right? Yeah. Well, it's a challenge, and Patricia uh, Ruiz Navarro, you've you helped us uh, enlighten us about uh, some of these emotional, powerful forces and issues. Uh, as a professor of psychology, obviously you, you, you have a, an understanding of this migration issue, 
more from the human side and yeah. the impact it has on um, the development, particularly of children uh, and, and the different types of immigrants we see now. Uh, well, I want to thank you for this opportunity to just uh, talk a little bit more about this uh, important topic uh, for our listeners, again, to, to understand that migration is a complex issue, social, political, economic, so many variables. Uh, and now we've got also, in the case of the Central Americans, you've got this country of transit in between Mexico, which has its own challenges and issues, uh, but no easy solutions. And, and ultimately, it's going to need cooperation and coordination from all yeah, different actually, places. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and that's, uh, you know, well, that's the challenge we have. Uh, we're going to stop on that, and uh, we continue to have to have a chance to talk more about different aspects of the migration uh, issue because it's going to be with us for quite some time. Uh, thank you, our listeners, for joining us. I'm here with Dr. Patricia Ruiz Navarro at the University of the Americas in Puebla, Mexico. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll look to see you here on the next episode of Global Connections. Thank you. Aloha.